afraid of venturing into Northbridge. Quite a few people said, I'm too scared to go. No, only if the Lord calls, then if he calls, he anoints. And you can go like a king and you can wander around and say, this belongs to me and uh, the house of God. So thank you for your consideration for next weekend. And I have a sense before this meeting's finished, we ought maybe give opportunity to really sow into that. We just need a few thousand more to cover all the expenses. It's ballooned out a little bit to about 14,000. And we're up to about eight towards 9,000, which is excellent. But we'd love to just get that last bit and just cut it off so we don't have to owe any credit to any bills. We say, here we are, we pay well. And Christians shouldn't pay less, we should pay what it's worth and give a bit more for a blessing. So we are rich in Jesus. It's great to have you here this morning, and I think it's still this morning. And even though it's holidays and summer away, we're here. And you only need two or more before the Lord rocks up. And particularly I acknowledge this uh, precious family who've lost their husband and father and we're declaring that the love of God in this place, I believe, will begin to just minister to you today. It's great to have you. It's uh, Lillian's sister and family and I don't know all the, the young ladies, but it's lovely to have you this morning. And Jesus is here as the comforter and the strengthener. I felt in my heart this morning to share a few words that... Um, a, a phrase that I've read many times in Scripture... And I've never really got deeply into it, but it's about the sure mercies of David. Have you heard that expression? Have you seen that phrase in a number of scriptures, both Old and New Testament? Well, by the end of this lesson, I think we'll have a greater understanding of what this may, in fact, infer uh, to the sure mercies of David. I believe it's a very exciting hour in which we live. I mean, talk about action. Everywhere you look, even in the nations, there is tremendous action. And part of what's happening is that God is, I believe in this season, answering the unfulfilled intercession that's been made over many, many years. Prayers that have been prayed from the womb of the church that have been stored up for a time such as this. Secondly, not only unfulfilled uh, intercession, but secondly, unfulfilled prophetic promises. The very promises of God that we haven't seen come to pass in our experience or in our, in, our, uh, in our family or in our community life, but I believe they're about to come to pass because God has promised. Remember, prophetic promises have a time frame, and I believe this is a time frame for God to bear his arm and do great things. Uh, thirdly, uh, those who know their God and those who embrace the promises and the word of God and step out in faith They form a threefold chord that the book of Ecclesiastes says is not easily broken. The unfulfilled intercession that is about to be answered before our eyes, the unfulfilled promises of God that he's made to us individually and corporately. Thirdly, those who know their God and are standing in faith, that forms a threefold chord that won't easily be broken. The intercession that's been made, the promises that have been given, and men and women who just will not let go of their God. That's us. And that threefold cord, I believe, uh, is putting uh, something before the throne of God which is requiring divine action. You know, God doesn't mind us putting pressure on his word. He doesn't mind us putting demands on the word. In fact, that's how the covenant works. He says, you bring to remembrance that word. You bring it before me. You declare it. And it requires divine action. When a church in faith says, Lord, we have prayed, and Lord, you have promised. And we find that there's this escalation, which I believe is happening in this time. It's been happening for a couple of years, but it's really building up now throughout the nations. And Amos chapter 9, verse 13, gives us a a tremendous clue and key as to what's happening here. If you can find Amos, you're a better man than I am. Because it sort of gets tucked away in there somewhere. Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Amos chapter 9. Don't stop, pretend you found it. Keep looking. I told you the story. We were caught out once when the pastor said, turn to the scripture and we stopped pretending we knew. And he said, would you read it out for me? And of course it was, you know, I was in Habakkuk chapter 95 and it was like, um, yeah, well... So Amos 9.13 says this, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that the ploughman shall overtake the reaper 
and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that the ploughman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. Here we have a picture, I believe it's the end of the age, a picture when the cycle of sowing and the cycle of reaping merge together. There's such an escalation of the harvest that has been promised through the intercession and the promises and the faith uh, combined together that even as we're still sowing seed, we're finding that there's also a reaping of harvest in such a measure that the two cycles are now merging rather than the time to sow and the time to reap. All of a sudden, in one generation, there's the sowing, but then there's the reaping and the sowing and the reaping and the sowing and the reaping and the sowing and the reaping happening because the intercession has been heard and the time is now to answer it. The prophetic promises have been embraced by uh, people who know their God and are ready to do great exploits for God. Now prophetically people are saying this is the season, this is the hour and there's evidence of it on the earth. We call it revival. There's evidence of this tremendous increase. It is breaking forth and it's, it's opening up nations for God and I believe that it's absolutely knocking on the door of our city. I believe it's already in our hearts. It's not an event waiting to happen. It's an anointing that's already gathering momentum. Revival. It's one of those words that that, that people get touchy about it. But it is a biblical word and God breathes again. The intercessions answer, answer, the promises come to pass and those who know their God, they do exploits for God. So this, this cord, I believe threefold cord, is demanding divine action as the weight of these three areas pressed before and press into the throne of God. Now it's interesting, as I said in Daniel chapter 11, those who know their God, Daniel chapter 11, and uh, the word know there is a word which means um, to perceive, to understand, to acquire knowledge, to discern, to be acquainted with, to cause to know, to be aware of. There's a number of meanings that come from the word those who know their God from Daniel chapter 11 verse 32 but those who know their God shall do exploits and the Hebrew meaning of this knowing God used 944 times which means it's an absolute utter important word to understand throughout scripture 944 times to know God talks about a variety of levels of intimacy it talks about levels of knowing God talks about degrees of intimacy in knowing God the highest is that uh, likened unto uh, the physical union of a husband and a wife, that complete, total spirit, soul and body intimacy, the knowing of God completely, totally, absolutely. And we are in the process of knowing God. Hosea the prophet said, those who go on to know their God. So we don't stop right now and say, yep, I know God. Well, we know something about God and we know a lot about God through Jesus Christ, but there's more to know in degrees of intimacy. That's why there's a desire, I'm going on, I'm learning more. Tell me, Lord, reveal more, open up the word to me, Jesus. Uh, We've been saying it for years, more, Lord, more, Lord. And it's appropriate to say it. Some people say, you've got it all, you don't need more. Well, we've got it as an inheritance, but we don't know it by experience yet. And so we're learning to go deeper and deeper into the very heart of God. And an important concept arises from the scriptures about knowing God And it talks about how we know God by experience through our journey in life. Knowing God by experience, applying the word to the daily affairs of life and knowing God in our own experience along the journey. And it doesn't take you and me too long to realise on the journey that we're weak. It doesn't take us too long to realise we actually can't do this without God that without him I actually can do nothing. We don't take long, if we're honest, to realise, Lord, this is beyond me. I need you. Every moment, every day, I need you, God. And that level of knowing is vital because some people don't arrive at that understanding. They say, well, I know God because they know some facts about God. They've done some studies about God. But the Hebrew language says those who by experience are getting to know God more intimately on their journey in life's experiences. And there's nothing like knowing God in the midst of a problem. 
There's nothing like knowing God in the midst of failure. There's nothing like knowing the heart of God when you've made a mess of things. As Galatians says, even when I'm overtaken in a fault. Now, there wouldn't be one of us here today, except the most deceived of us, who says, I have no fault, or I've had no failure, or I don't have problems. You wouldn't be here. You'd be sitting in the church of the first deceived. And there'd probably be quite a big congregation. But those of us who say, you know what? I'm broken before God. The more I know God, the more I realise how I can't do this, how I'm weak, how I'm not together. But God says, I don't despise the broken and the contrite heart. I am attracted to brokenness. This is the thing about knowing God. He's attracted to weakness. He's attracted to your problem because his eyes are looking to see on whose behalf he can be strong. It implies he's looking for the weak. It implies he's looking for the one who says, I need your help, Lord God, Daddy God. And so the concept of religion is that you've got to be strong and you've got to do this well and you've got to have this outward form, maybe even be a perfectionist in serving God. But God doesn't look at it that way. He says, those who know me understand that I know your weakness, I know your problems, I know all the issues about your life, past, present, future, and I'm greatly attracted to you. And he comes running to us, aggressing towards us to help in time of trouble. That's one of the things I love about God. He's not repelled by weakness, he's attracted. He's not repelled by our problems. He's attracted to it. He's not repelled from f human failure. He says, that's why they need a father. And he rushes towards us like he did the prodigal son. It's one of the most attractive uh, parts of the character and the nature of God and God's love is the way that he deals with failure and the way he deals with problems and the way he deals with difficulties. With that as an as a underlying truth this morning, I want to have a look at some, some, some of the great characters of God, just, just briefly, but nevertheless to make a point. And uh, we know that uh, the getting to know God involves acknowledging weakness, failure, inability. But then matched with that, we see God in his attraction to failure comes with redemption. Failure hold hands with redemption. God comes to redeem, to buy back that which is broken. That's just the nature of salvation. And we see it so clearly through the whole law, looking through the covenant called the law. We see that the law is like the schoolmaster that pointed to the problems. It kept pointing to the failure, pointing to the weakness, pointing to the inability. The law pointed to a standard that you and I could not achieve. And so the law itself pointed to the failure of man to be able to honour God and to live for God's glory. That was the whole purpose of the law, so that the people would come to God and say, God, we really need you, we want you, we desire you. It doesn't always work that way, but that's what it's desired to do. So in 1 John 3.21, we read this about the condition of our heart, even in the midst of failure. How many of us have known failure? Okay, I didn't look, but I'm assuming some hands went up. 1 John 3, 21. Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence towards God. Now, one of the problems with failure, or Galatians, 3, uh, Galatians 6 calls it uh, one who's overtaken in a fault, or Romans 8 says our inability to produce the right results, in our infirmity, uh, inability to produce the right results, uh, we find that... Sometimes the heart begins to wear the effect of that weakness, that failure, that inability, the, the deficit or the lack. The heart begins to feel condemned. And that's why it says in 1 John 3, 21, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence before God. It says actually in verse 20, if our heart does condemn us, God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. You know, the wonderful thing about God is the foreknowledge of God that God knows all things before they even happen. He knows the end from the beginning. It's very interesting if he knew your life and my life before he called us and yet he still called us. 
Sometimes you think he's made a, made a mistake. God, if I was you, I wouldn't have called me. But he, praise God, he's not us. He's God. Because God says, yep, I can see there's some failure coming up. I can see some issues and problems, but I'm also going to apply redemption. Even before, even before the call, I know you. And the one that I know, the foreknowledge, I predestine or I foreordain that you conform to the image of my son Jesus. That's the call of God upon our life, the one that he knows before. He ordains we become into the conformity of the image of Jesus. That's the number one call upon our life. But he looks at us beginning to end and he knows exactly the choices we're going to make and the consequences of the choices we're going to make. Doesn't surprise God. Surprises others. Surprises others when we don't do as well as they all thought we were about to do. Doesn't surprise God. He's not caught unawares. He doesn't go, whoops, now I've got to get another plan in motion. Uh Uh-uh. God applies redemption to the human race and then he calls us knowing there's weakness, there's frailty, there's inabilities, there's all sorts of issues of heart and mind and he's already pronounces as perfect in Christ. It's incredible. It's the most gracious part of redemption. If the world knew, God understands God's already applied redemption, which is forgiveness, justification, righteousness and full redemption. It's already there even before you thought of falling or you thought of making the mistake or the greatest failure of your life. This is the most winsome thing about the call of God upon our lives. He knows all things. So it says, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have a confidence towards God. Confidence comes as the, a fruit of the process that releases us from the weakness and the failure and the sin. And of course, uh, fear, we know that fear of failure is a very real thing for many, many human beings. People are afraid to miss the mark. They're afraid to let others down. They're afraid to take the risk. That's why some cannot walk by faith. They're afraid that they may not be able to do it properly. Well, God knows about the fears of man and he also knows how to put faith in the heart of man. God instigates the life of faith. God gives us that initial force of faith and then we build on it as we hear the word of God. And God knows all things. Fear causes us to hide, which is why the human race hides from God. And shame, once shame is... is, taken into our spirit, it causes us to cover over and separate ourselves from God. Sin separates. Shame covers. Fear hides. Shame covers. Now you can cover your life even with a lot of religious activity. Do the outward form but deny the reality of God's truth coming in to where the pain is, the failure is, the weakness is. Cover over. Uh, sometimes people do it with their work commitments. They cover over with a, you know, an 80-hour work commitment. I'm just working, 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 working. Sometimes you have to wonder, is that covering some deeper need uh, or, a, or an over-the-top uh, social life or sport commitment or even church activities, you know, nine nights a week, I'm committed to the church. Well, maybe there's some sort of covering over, doing an outward form but denying the reality of God, here I am. In my naked state, here I am. Fear hides, shame covers. We need to stop hiding. We need to take the covers off and say, here I am, God. Naked and unashamed, shine your light into my heart. God is a redeemer. God is a restorer. God is a reviver. God is for us and God is not against us. Confidence is the fruit of that process that releases us from any sense of failure. And God does it through his covenant. He makes covenant. And the covenant redeems our failure. And I, I won't go into it in, in, a long, uh, in depth, but I was thinking of Moses. I mean, Moses, what a great leader, what a great deliverer, and yet what great failure. I mean, there, there, are, there are portions of scripture that just point to the failure of Moses, and yet we still see him as a great leader and as a great, uh, a great uh, deliverer of Israel. Uh, his failure did cost him. There was a price tag. His price tag was 40 years in the wilderness. That's quite a significant price tag. Even though he was forgiven, it's not about, the the issue is not about being forgiven. We're forgiven. We're all forgiven. But we have to understand there are consequences of wrong choices. Now, what that does for me, it motivates me. It actually motivates me to say, you know what? Before I even go down that line of thinking, there are some consequences to the wrong choice. There's a price tag. The price tag is not rejection by God. It's not a, a, a burden of condemnation of the heart. 
It's just a ripple effect, particularly through relationships. And one of the hardest things to restore is broken relationships, as you and I know that. And it takes really the grace of God to restore broken relationship. It's easy to restore with God because God's just so forgiving and merciful and kind and gracious. Not quite as easy with one another because we're not quite God-like yet. Not fully. We've still got a bit of <clears throat> in us. Well, praise God, is being driven out of us by his grace. The more grace we get, the more grace we give. The more mercy we get, the more mercy we can give. So we have to let go of uh, these things so that we can have a confidence before God. And it comes because of the covenant God has made. Moses, according to scriptures, I mean, he was going to deliver Israel his way and he was going to show the strength of his own arm and he's going to kill the Egyptians and he's going to prove that he's the saviour and the deliverer. And what a mess he got himself into. And yet towards the end of his time, he spent 40 days and 40 nights with a different heart interceding now for Israel, interceding for Aaron, interceding that God would come and bless and save and keep. God had used that which was a failure, terrible failure, and turned and softened his heart, put compassion in him and caused him to pray. And there's a lot more I could go into, but time doesn't permit this morning. Uh, Saul of Tarsus, I mean, what a naughty boy he was, and yet what a wonderful apostle he was. We see him breathing threatenings on the church and he's taking captive the Christians and he's throwing them into prison and he's using his religious zeal to persecute Christ. And we see tremendous uh, weakness and failure in that sense. And yet we see the great call of God that comes to him. We see the mercy and grace of God as God begins to speak. So why are you persecuting me? And God begins to bring redemption and he applies it to Saul of Tarsus and he becomes a great teacher and a great leader and responsible for so much of the scripture of revelation to us today. But particularly I want to look at David today, just for a few minutes, to look at David. I love the story of David. I think for some reason it just touches our hearts in such a wonderful way. And if we, we start, well, there's so much to say about David. Second Samuel have a look at Second Samuel. Anyone enjoy this, the truth of David's life? I think one of the things that impresses me is his heart after God. I think that's the thing that re- sits deeply within us. He has that heart, doesn't he? It's been forged through trial and tests. And, but he right back in Second Samuel chapter 7, and uh, beginning in verse 1, It came to pass when the king sat in his house and the Lord had given him rest round about from his enemies that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go and do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. There's a key there. Go and do all that is in thine heart. Just try and remember that. Do what's in your heart. Do what's in your heart. For the Lord is with thee. And then we move on again in, in Second Samuel again, just picking it up perhaps in verse 12. In verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So this is a tremendous covenant God is making. I will be his father and he shall be my son. And if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the right of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him. Now look at this. As I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. And thy throne shall be established forever. Here we have this tremendous word that comes. Nathan the prophet is delivering the word of God to David and uh, God is promising something quite remarkable to David. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, God is promising something very, very remarkable. He's saying, David, I'm going to establish you and I'm going to establish a covenant and your seed, in this case this is now Solomon, you know the story of David, and how Solomon came forth, the second son, and how Solomon would be raised up. It says God loved Solomon. And Solomon's going to have this, you know, the Solomon's temple as a, as a great uh, uh, 
proof that the favor of God was upon him and that he would be remembered and established even for all generations. God is establishing a covenant with David which is fulfilled in Christ, extended in Christ, amplified in Christ, an everlasting covenant, and it's based on mercy. It says, I took the mercy of Saul and I'm putting that sure mercy upon you. Now, if we were to ask why, we know that Saul, number one, he violated his office as king. He did not fulfill the call upon his life to get rid of all the enemy. He did a certain amount of warfare, then he just left one area, he said, well, I'm not tackling that thing. Even though God commanded him, the call was to get rid of all the work of the enemy so there'd be no room for the enemy to come against him in a further season. Same principle for us today. If we don't stand strong and get rid of all the work of of darkness, they will bite us in another season. And so we find that the anointing was lifted off Saul. It says the spirit of the Lord departed from him. He lost his office as king. He lost the call upon his life. God says, I've taken it off Saul and I've put it on you. Now the difference is this, because God knew, remember foreknowledge of God? God knew all about David. God knew that he's going to be able to trust David and an everlasting covenant would be made. He'd have the right heart and God was going to show all the nations of the world what a covenant can do with a righteous man. Now, this is 2 Samuel 7. This is very interesting. David has not even met Bathsheba. David has not yet had the opportunity to sin with Bathsheba. That's recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 11. God's got in way before it's all happened. God knows it's going to happen and God's already established a covenant with him based on sure mercy. That blows me away. I would have thought if God knew how he was about to disqualify himself, I would have removed the covenant and waited for someone else to step up to the mark. That's how we as humans think. Oh, well, he's missed the mark. He's had his chance. Now let's wait for someone else who's better than him to rise up. That's not the way of God. That's why we have to gently restore those who are overtaken by a fault. That's why we need to put people back into position because God himself, as long as the heart is to fulfill the call, then God will always keep you in the right place or the position called the office. Now, even if you lose the office, even if someone like Absalom, I think of Absalom and David, Absalom you know, wormed his way up and he got rid of uh, David out of the line and Absalom, Absalom got to the throne and he became king. David lost, seemingly lost the office. But he never lost the call and because he didn't lose the call, he regained the office. Further down the track, God says, no, you're the king. Remember this, the one who God calls, God anoints. The one who God anoints, God appoints. The only problem here with all of this is if you lose the call. In other words, I'm not fulfilling the call. I'm not going to do what God says. And I'm not going to have a repentant heart about it. Now, well, we're then put in a basket which says, I love you, but I can't use you. I love you, but I can't use you. Why? Because the call is how God uses us to contribute towards his kingdom. That's the call of God upon our lives. Ephesians 2.10, to do good works. That's the call upon our lives, to do good works. He calls us. As long as you and I pursue the call... Even in the midst of failure. See, this is what stuns me about the foreknowledge of God. Second Samuel 7. Nathan's prophesied, David, an everlasting covenant. Not only you, your seed. Now at this stage, Solomon's not even in the picture. I mean, Bathsheba's not even in the picture. But he's in the picture in God's heart and God's mind. God says, I see what's going to happen. I see the consequences of what's going to happen. But because he's got the heart to fulfill the call, I'm establishing an everlasting covenant and it's going to be a sign for everybody in the human race who follows the call of God. If you keep the call, you'll be reinstated to your office even if you lose it. And you'll keep the anointing. Now why is it that then Christianity is littered with men and women who've failed and fallen and then have been sidelined, pushed away, rejected, spoken about, cursed with the words of fellow Christians saying they can't be used. Look at the mess they've made. What a shocking example they've been. But that's not the heart of God. There may be truth in all that you just said that that's not the bottom line. God says, but I've made an everlasting covenant. And even failure cannot violate the covenant. 
Even a massive fall is not enough for you to lose the call. Isn't that awesome? I tell you, we could pack this place 25 times over today with people who are sitting at home going, I'm not worthy to go to church. I'm not worthy to mix with Christians. I'm not worthy. I've messed it up. I've missed the mark. Look at the failure of my life. God knew it before it happened. God knew it before you and I even thought of it. And God says, as I see the failure happening, I'm applying redemption. I'm buying it back. I'm paying the full price for the penalty. Second chapter 7, Dathan says, this is what's going to happen. Second Samuel 11, the whole story of Bathsheba. It's not light reading and it's not pleasant reading. I mean, this whole thing with Bathsheba is based on adultery and it's based on murder. It's based on huge cover-up. It's based on all the wickedness that makes some of the Channel 7 series exciting to people who live in the flesh. Wow, more adultery. Wow, murder. Wow. Biblical stories, I tell you, some of them are the most exciting of all. But in the midst of it, God says, I see it. It's part of the human condition. It's part of the weakness of man. It's part of the workings of flesh. It's part of the world of darkness. And I'm applying redemption to it. A person's worst failure becomes their strongest platform for future victory. Because they will forever know that this is the grace and the mercy of God. And they'll apply this principle of sure mercy. Sure mercy. They will know sure mercy and they will apply sure mercy. Isaiah 55, 1 to 3. Hang in just for a couple more minutes. Are you still with me this morning? Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, there's so many beautiful truths in it. 55 verses 1 to 3. Ho, everyone that thirsts, come to the water. He that has no money, come and buy. Eat, come and buy wine and milk without money, without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and you will labour for that which doesn't satisfy? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Verse 3. Incline your ear, come unto me, hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, say it with me, even the sure mercies of David. Even the sure mercies of David, because I've given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. This is the same David whose greatest failure is written throughout the scriptures for us to remember. But God redeemed the failure. And God brought back. And God honoured that which was right about all that David had done to that point. And God had already said, whatever's in your heart. And the heart, of course, was I want to build a house. Well, the Lord used Solomon to fulfil the dream that was in his father's heart. You know, the thing about progeny is this, spiritual progeny or natural progeny. When God puts something in your heart and it seems to fall to the ground, God has every intention of picking that thing back up and putting it back either in your heart or in your bloodline or spiritual bloodline. That's just the nature of God. And why would it be that way? Number one, God absolutely highly esteems your contribution to the building of his kingdom. God values it far more than humankind could ever understand it. Your contribution to the building of the kingdom of God is highly valued by God to such a degree that, you know what, the good work is never lost. It's never lost. Even if you lose the call and you lose the office and you lose the anointing, that which you've done is eternal. Because God says this is what this eternal covenant is going to be. I'm going to establish the work of your hands. Some of us may have stopped functioning in the callings that we've been called to, or we might have not uh, been able to rise up to the heights we wanted to. But I want to tell every single person in this room, and I'm speaking to me as well, the things we've done in God still stand as a testimony and as a witness, not to our greatness, but to the greatness of the covenant. Every word, every prayer, every prophecy, every heart intent, every heartfelt cry, God says it's registered. It's part of this unfulfilled intercession that's about to break forth. 
What the enemy wants you and me to think is, well, it's all been a bit of a waste, hasn't it? Now that you've missed the mark, now that you've messed up the marriage, now that the kids have gone astray, now that you've got a taste for alcohol, now that you want to watch some things that are not very savoury, you are a useless bit of waste. That's what the enemy does to Christians. He does it more to Christians than to the world. It's already got the world's heart and mind. But he loves wiping the floor with Christians who are spiritually uneducated. They don't know, but I've got a covenant of sure mercy. And of this one thing I am certain, God is always merciful to me. God highly esteems your contribution to the kingdom. No one may ever tell you that they're pleased with what you've done. You may never get the pat on the back. No one may be sore it, but you did it unto God. God said it's registered and there's an eternal blessing attached to it. And even if you cannot fulfill it, I'm going to find someone who carries it in their heart to do it because this is an everlasting covenant. I find that so fantastic, so exciting, so thrilling, so desirous that you just want to keep going and serving God. The sure mercies of David, the sure mercy. Acts 13, 32, 34 picks it up as well. Is this helping anyone this morning? Yeah. Acts 13, 32 and 34. Acts 13, 32. We declare unto you glad tidings, good news, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children. In that he raised up Jesus again, as it is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Here we have this, in verse 34, is concerning that he raised him up from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. There is again, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Now in Jesus Christ, of course, we have the sure mercy of David. We have a covenant of mercy which extends such incredible grace to us God says, I'm not even going to remember those things. People say, oh, well, that's before I was a Christian. No, this can happen at any given moment in time. It's the same principle of sure mercy. Regardless of whether you're mature in your Christian walk but take a tumble, overtaken by a fault, it's not just young Christians who make mistakes. I mean, let's be honest about it. You can go as, as deep into maturity and find, I, I just missed the mark. I just transgressed the Lord. I just had an iniquity that, that was bearing down on me. Iniquity means the moral weakness of the generations. You know, the, the, the dice that's loaded against you, the coin that seems to be just not quite in your favour in that area. What is this weight? Well, these are iniquities. Praise God, Jesus died for all iniquity on the cross and blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven and his iniquity is not remembered. But you've got to get those patterns and you've got to put them back on Calvary. You say, you know what? I don't have to pay the price for this thing. I acknowledge it. The way to get the core working in your life, acknowledge the weakness, the failure, the sin. Number two, receive the forgiveness of God, unconditional forgiveness. Thirdly, receive justification so that we know that it's like there is no sin. Fourthly, receive the gift of righteousness. Not only is the, is the negative wiped away, now I'm in, I'm in the positive. I'm not in the red, I'm in the black. Some people say it's wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Of course it is. But now I'm so glad that I've got the gift of righteousness and I reign with Christ. I'm going beyond red. I'm, I mean, I'm really into the black now. I'm serving God with gladness. Because of the fruit, the fruit that appeared, the moment I was made the mistake and I received the forgiveness and the justification and now the gift of righteousness, the one who's righteous, he reigns in life. Do you know the New Testament doesn't record all of David's weaknesses? The New Covenant doesn't expose all the stuff that David did. It actually starts to talk about the great legacy he left. The one whose heart was the, the kind of heart that God wanted and, and the legacy of David and, and the, the house that was built through Solomon and his son and, and all the eternal rewards. Why isn't the New Testament full of that? All wiped away at the cross. All fully paid for, dealt with, power of it broken. And yet Saul could have had the same blessing and the same benefit because he, he, was, he was going to be in that place where he could have really reigned as a king and done it properly. But sin found in his, it was found in his heart. He didn't deal with it, didn't acknowledge it. 
It's not that there's sin, it's what you do with it. It's not that there's weakness, it's how you, you handle it. It's not that there's a great failure, it's just what's going to happen next. I think the only failure is the failure to get up. I think the only failure really is the failure to get up. If you've got enough people keeping you down, it's hard to get up. So what does the Lord say to us? He says, the sure mercy of David that's in your heart, extend it to someone else. Extend mercy. Give them the grace. Help them up. Restore them gently, it says, like you're putting a bone back into position, a dislocated joint. Just gently do it. Gently do it. I love the sure mercy of David. I love it fulfilled and extended and expanded in Christ. Praise God, my heart no longer condemns me. Hallelujah. If your heart doesn't condemn you, you have confidence to go towards God. If you've got confidence, you can fulfill the call. Because the one God calls, he anoints. You just receive it. You believe it. Don't even have to feel it. You just believe it. Some of you are feelers and jumpers and shakers, but some of us don't have any outward thing. But on the inside, hey, we're jumping. I'm shaking on the inside. Hallelujah. But the evidence is whether you've got a confidence before God and whether you do the very thing that's in your heart. See, people say, Pastor Phil, I don't know how to serve God. What's in your heart? What's in your heart? Oh, well, now that you ask, I have got this desire. Oh, probably God put it there. Hallelujah. Nathan said, what's in your heart? What's in your heart? What's in your heart? Well, in our heart today, there's revival. In our heart, there's the restoration of our loved ones. In our heart, there's a strengthening of the home life. In our heart, there's a, there's a mercy to be extended to the city of Perth. I mean, you, you, you could have gone into the streets of Northbridge yesterday and it was a little bit hairy. But, you know, you can either stand there with, a, with judgment or you can say, sure mercies, sure mercy, sure mercies, sure mercies. And you watch the judgment of God come and then you see the mercy of God move his hand. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Why do so many people want to judge people? Jesus was judged so that mercy could be applied to the human race. Now God will have the final say and the final judgments, but let's extend mercy. Mercy, 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 mercy. When's the last time you walked past a nightclub and you yelled out, Sure mercies! <laughs> well, I've never done it either. In fact, in fact, I've never thought of doing it till just then. Well, that would have to have some effect. And you don't have to go to Northbridge to have violence. You have to look over your backyard sometimes. All the street brawls and street parties and all the things that are happening. And you and I hold a key. And the key is, sure mercy. Sure mercy. Even if you failed, here's redemption. God's paid a price for it. Rise up. Sure mercies. Hallelujah. So Father, this morning we receive the sure mercies of David through Jesus Christ our Lord. Forgiven, restored, Amen. redeemed, and now reigning in life. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anthea, where's Anthea this morning? Where's Anthea? Come, doll. Just come. I just want to... This, is a, this couldn't be planned better. God must be in the house. Anthea just said uh, the other day she'd love to have her little one dedicated to Christ. And, you know, th exactly what I said today is something that applies to you in your bloodline. And, of course, you know Wendy is grandma to the baby. Where's grandma? And uh, Anthea is Wendy's daughter, and this is the little boy. And she wants him brought to Christ today. And what we're declaring today is, Anthea, if you will bring him up in the knowledge of God, knowledge of the word of God, give him access to uh, Christian teaching and do that which you know to do. God will establish something in this child. And the thing that's been in your heart since you've come to Christ recently is that you know, all the things of the past are finished, broken, washed away, cleansed, delivered, finished. And this child is going to have a tremendous blessing poured out on him and he will fulfill the good works of God and when the disciples were trying to hold the children back, Jesus said, let the children come, for such is the kingdom of heaven. 
And if you will just, you know, continue to grow in grace and keep seek, seeking God, search the scriptures and order your life in such a way that it just honours God and helps this child. I'm not demanding a, a perfection, I'm just demanding a desire. Yeah? It's the desire that God looks at. And if you will fully do that, Deuteronomy says that uh, he will write that in your heart and in your mind and it will be impressed upon the children. Now this little kid's got a, actually a very special anointing on his life. On Wednesday I recognised it. He was just in the supernatural healing meeting and uh, he was responding to the Holy Spirit. And at a certain point there was a call. This, this kid came up and I could I sort of almost missed him because he stood like here and my eyes are up like that. And I'm waiting for who needs to respond to the call. And I realised this little kid had already responded to the call of God. The power of the Spirit was on him. I don't remember if he got slain. Did he get slain in the spirit? But, um, Not no, no, no. Okay. But the, the anointing was all over a little child responding to the cry of God. I, that just touched, touched my heart so wonderfully. So we dedicate him today, a little Matthew. You can just reach out to him, you guys. We say that this child is a part of the body of Christ. He does have his own faith. He knows enough about God and Jesus to want Jesus. He does move in the Holy Spirit according to the grace upon his life. And we dedicate him and we say that the pain and the hurt, uh, Anthea, that you've known will not be upon this child. It's been wiped away at the cross. You don't have to live in regret. You don't have to look back and say, oh my, oh my. God has redeemed all past failure as he has done for every one of us today. And this child has a covenant established with them that he will know God. Ever increasing levels of intimacy and even if perchance he has faults and he has things that little boys have, and so do the little girls, uh, that he will find redemption. He will find saving redemption. We dedicate you, Matthew, to the Lord in Jesus' mighty name. Probably a little bit big for me to kiss, so you can kiss him for me, darling. And someone can kiss Wendy just for fun. God bless, God bless, God bless. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 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 You want to say it? You come. You come. You come.